Hey everybody, this is Dan. And this is Ron. We got another special guest where it's like the tonight show over here. We we got we got a booking agent. We got uh we have people coming through here all the time. We haven't printed up the mugs yet, but uh, they're coming. Anyway, you met him before. Uh, it's uh, Dorian Wallace from the Tristero Collective, and uh, you, you got a podcast too, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We'll we'll we'll, we'll get into that. So, you can plug in later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, hey, what's hey, up, Dorian? Dorian? <laughs> And so I, I went to Dorian and I said, what movie should we talk about? And he said, The Holy Mountain, 1973, Alejandro Jodorowsky. I think that's close. Um, and yeah, so uh, good to have you on the program. Yeah, man, men. men yes, men. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's this, this movie um, has a very special place in my heart uh mm. just because it's um you know like like I'm, I'm definitely like like you know I'm a composer by trade but uh I'm definitely like a cinephile like I, I just fucking love movies and you know there was a period of my life uh that was you know all about finding you know the strangest movie or the weirdest movie or and like this like always was number one <laughs> uh in in regards to just like you know as as a teenager and or young college age individual this this movie was mind-blowing uh but but as I've gotten older you know and it's less around and uh less about like finding things that are weird or you know trippy or whatnot it's like this movie still holds up uh just in regards to you know the really dense philosophy <laughs> that's kind of baked in it and uh just all the really wild social commentary uh mm -hmm. that uh yeah and so um you know it's this is still like a movie that if i want to like let somebody decide if they want to be friends with me or not i put this <laughs> on and if they're still around then it's like okay cool like <laughs> uh you know like it, it's it's basically like it's a warning shot to anybody who gets to know me like it's like it's like yeah just so you know like like it's like this you know all the time <laughs> I, like, <laughs> like i've seen this movie more than you know more than 20 times like oh wow okay so there's like a lot of ice sculpture dicks going through your house yeah yeah tons tons and like yeah just like i'm always covered in tarantulas with like <laughs> water shooting out of spray things on the side of my eyes it's it's very surreal uh i poop into so many glass jars and turn it into gold like it's just very very uh <laughs> that, that that's all i do that's just all, all of this and that but, pretty much um, sums up the movie so all right yeah cool all right well thanks for having happened. me on yeah. and uh yeah <laughs> i do you want to take a stab at explaining uh, or at describing this movie sure so the gist i guess like to to really explain it to to a novice uh, you know like to a uh yeah uh, a, a a a holy mountain celibate a yeah a noob um i guess i would i would say it's divided up into two major parts and it's um there's this like main dude who's the thief uh and he's kind of like a christ-like figure um he's sort of you know he's an ascetic he's he's a bum um but he <laughs> it's he gets mistaken i'm uh, sorry you just described jesus as a bum but go on yeah yeah i mean but like he gets mistaken as like uh as as you know this higher power messiah being and mm -hmm. and really kind of takes advantage of that uh but um kind of starts to learn some of the repercussions of of having this um this responsibility suddenly thrown at him because he was doing it in sort of a dishonest way uh so then somehow he goes to this tower and he goes to the top of the tower where he meets this uh, uh, alchemist and um played by alejandro uh, jodorowsky and that's where the second half of the movie begins, where um, he, alongside basically various 
beings from uh from different planets in in the solar system uh who each get their own elongated backstory um uh meet to train with the alchemist so that they can climb the holy mountain to find i'm gonna just say like find the meaning of life uh at, at the top of this mountain which uh how much of a spoiler can i give for the ending is it cool if i Oh yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Is this really yeah. a spoiler movie? Well, well. So, so they get. You have to realize, I didn't know the first time I saw it that like that was how it was going to end. But it basically gets to they are at the top of the mountain, we think, and they're all having like dinner or like you know like a party, and it backs off, and you see that it's a camera crew, and it literally is just a movie. And you need to find your own meaning. This movie's not going to do it for you. <laughs> it was all a dream. Yeah, like it just so, you know. Um, one one interesting fact before we really get into a lot of uh, the rest of the film, but one really interesting fact is I learned that um, Jodorowsky had filmed this entire movie and then really made it a point to try to delete about twenty minutes worth of dialogue. Oh, post-production really? yeah so like like so it's just there's a part that blows my mind that there's actually a script out there that that, <laughs> that was filmed and acted and everything and, and he just like got rid of it um so yeah it, it's there's very very little dialogue especially uh in the first half of the film right, right. um yeah 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 uh so i don't know does that does that describe is that a good description yeah yeah i think yeah. Uh, the one thing is that the beings from the uh, the beings from the other planets are also very powerful humans on earth so they're like uh arms dealer um police know, they're on different planets though what was that they're all on different planets they're 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 of different planets but they're they're powerful entities on earth oh okay so they're like superman no, like the um, the the woman who's an arms dealer, and they even they create like uh, what was it psychedelic guns? Um, oh yeah, yeah, but uh, but like Superman, the marketing he's, people. he's from another planet, and he's more powerful on Earth because of the yellow sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. Oh, and you left out the uh, conquistador frogs defeating the Aztec lizard. That's yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I know there's so many things like that. But you mentioned the tarantulas and the squirting, and uh... so I was trying to remember if I've seen this movie before. There was a movie that I saw something like 20 years ago. I'm like, this sounds. This was it. About 10 minutes into it, I was I I, I was certain that this was it. I could never remember the name of that movie or too many details. And I would describe it as Mexican Jesus goes up a mountain. And the filmmaker is Mexi is Mexican. The movie is set in Mexico. Um, there's like that whole thing with the, the, <laughs> the recreation of the conquistadors. <laughs> taking wait, over. wait, so I gotta okay. check in on something. Yeah. So this, is, this movie's in English, right? I didn't watch a dubbed version. Uh, it is in English as far as okay. I remember. Yeah. Like I've never seen a non-English version. Right. Um, yeah. But I think they're Mexican actors. I mean, they, 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 they don't try to hide the accents. Right. Right. It's, it's, I think the, yeah, the whole cast and crew is Mexican. Um, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> um, yeah, there, there, there are so many, um, scenes like that, like, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm literally just, I have the Wikipedia open now just as sort of a reference, but <laughs> there's the line um, where, you know, the ex, uh, it, it says the thief wishing to find the source of the gold ascends, to the, ascends the tower. There he finds the alchemist and his silent assistant. After a confrontation with the alchemist, the thief defecates into a container. The excrement is transformed into gold by the alchemist who proclaims your excrement. You can change yourself into gold. The thief accepts the gold, but smashes a mirror with the gold when shown his reflection. The alchemist then takes the thief as an apprentice. <laughs> it's like, there's just so many scenes like that, that it's it's really hard to like, 
yeah. describe, I guess, in a, in a plot summary. Um, and that describes something like three minutes of the movie. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So what, what, what was your take on it? Um, you know, sort of reviewing this, this film. Should, should I go first or? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, so it definitely reminds me of a lot of other um, like late 60s, early 70s kind of transgressive avant-garde movies. This one might be the most extreme one that I've watched besides maybe Sweet Movie. Um, although, I mean, even that didn't have like a graphic like uh castration scene but uh yeah yeah so so like mr freedom by william klein uh did you did, did ever see wr mysteries of the organism no okay it's like his documentary about wilhelm reich the you, you know the orgone box guy yeah yeah and and yeah there's a lot of shots in this that seemed very similar to shots in that like the thing where She's doing the exercise where she's humping the mountain. Cause like like WR Mysteries of the Organism, it's like the ultimate 60s free love documentary. There's just like a lot of people air humping stuff for like mm. probably 75% of the movie. And there seems to be a lot of that in here. There's also uh shit like the the thing with the where the guy's collecting the thousand sets of testicles and uh and it it's sort of and it, it's shown like a kind of a fascist army there's there's like a visual reference to triumph of the will when the guy has a little rally before they go looking for the mountain and uh and that kind of follows a lot of reich's theories about fascism uh basically right reich, reich was a, a second wave freudian and uh he wrote a book called The Mass Psychology of Fascism, where he, he basically lays out a theory that uh, people are attracted to fascism because they feel some kind of symbolic impotence in their own lives, and then they transfer that to the leader, in this case, very literally by, you know, castration. Uh, there, there's a lot of castration stuff in this movie. And, um, and yeah, yeah, there's, there's uh, or like Pasolini Pigsty is another movie that kind of reminded mm -hmm any of this um but yeah like like I, I think this is going on more cylinders like like I, I this one's like a straight up surrealist movie like the middle of it becomes kind of a political agitprop movie for a bit um like some of the satire is pretty on the nose uh but the rest of it that's kind of dreamlike i think works better than a lot of the other more just straightforward like this is angry political stuff for like an hour and a half type movies um three boxes of popcorn <laughs> <laughs> right, okay how, how many stars did Leonard Malton give it Rod I, I no, we no, no. That. that's Matt's trick that's Matt's trick yeah um that's our, our, our friend Matt who's been on a few times he can mm. He can tell you what a Leonard, Leonard Walton review is within like a half star mm -hmm. um, with, with just a brief description of the movie or without a description. Well, if he knows the movie, he could tell you. Uh, he could wow. tell you. I ate half a burrito, I think, during it. So I don't know if that's my rating for it. So, uh, um, mm. so I'll say, well, I'm really I'm really interested in hearing um, your, your, your not the description but analysis of the movie uh, uh, Dorian so first of all I would um, uh, and I was already looking forward to it as I was watching the movie so first I'll say that I would pass your friend test I would watch the whole movie however <laughs> I would then give you a hard time about it for the next five years <laughs> oh yeah yeah that that's part of the friend test. oh okay like that, okay yeah 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 <laughs> Um, so if you come on again, I'm going to give you a hard time about it next time. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's a, I have a friend who like, I showed it to maybe six months before the pandemic began. It uh -huh. began and he still texts me like, dude, why? <laughs> so, yeah, no, that that's part of the friend test. Like, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or actually, you know what reminded me of a little bit was Ken Russell with all the dicks. Well, okay, I guess. Anything else about it? Um, kind of hippie culture stuff. Like, there's a lot of hippie culture stuff in Lyftomania. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Listomania, I think, is my go-to. By the way, Dorian, and this is where where the, this this is your uh, litmus test. I think listomania is mine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, listomania is up there for me for yeah. sure, but uh, I I think it's because I discovered the Holy Mountain before listomania. Mm. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think when, when I saw it the first time, um, had a couple of friends of mine and I had, uh, we called it movie club, it was just three of us, but the rule was we, um, every week we rotated who, 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 get, who chooses the movie. Um, and the only possible veto, czar, any, anyone had veto power, but under very limited circumstances, either one, they've seen it before and don't want to see it again or two, there's some content in it they're aware of that they found just so incredibly offensive, traumatic, painful, something like that, that is sort of beyond the pale that they refuse it to watch it for that reason. So just saying, eh, I don't think I like it, or eh, it's not my cup of tea, that's not enough, or I don't like that director or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that's not enough. It's It's gotta be something much more than this. So, so we watched almost every movie that, that, anybody, that anybody picked. So that's when I saw this. But I don't remember, I don't remember liking it, but I don't remember disliking it. That's why when it's like, I have very little memory of it. Like, so I don't even remember if I liked it. Or not. So I think it was good that I smoked up beforehand. Uh, a friend of mine recommended that I get stoned beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it made me enjoy the movie. It's not so, actually, it's not so much that it made me enjoy the movie more as I think I would have been irritated by it if I hadn't gotten stoned. So the irritation was gone so I could absorb it more really neat visual imagery um um and like i was i was i was blown away by the images um and, and at least for the first half of the movie i can't tell you what most of them meant and it felt well yeah it felt to me more like yeah i know there's some meaning there or something yeah or there's some commentary in there somewhere well but i mean there's some pretty of... uh, like jesus wouldn't like commercialism yeah but but if you know I don't I don't know what is the the what is the meaning of the frogs descending on uh, the Aztec capital and uh, well he's got the the boats behind him so it's it's Christian imperialism yeah they're the conquistadors yeah yeah so he's sitting on it it's a symbolic thing of of the uh, the West taking over and destroying the Aztec civilization kind of like uh, well so, it's a performance of, the, of it. It's not symbolic of it. It's yeah. the performance of it, just using frogs and lizards. What does that mean, using the frogs and the lizards? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. You know, um, I am. So I guess like to start off on the analysis is I don't know if I take uh, a lot of things as literally. I'm, I'm sure that Jodorowsky has a very literal meaning to all of all of these these things. So yeah. um I imagine he has a very specific reason why he used frogs and lizards for for that scene. Um, but the way uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll tell you everything I like about the movie, like. Um, and I just want to make it clear: I'm not saying I disliked it. I actually. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um. So no, let let me start off with the things that I actually, uh, you know, aside from the like ridiculousness of the movie, like <laughs> I, I love the concept that this movie exists. That that's right. probably my favorite part of it uh, mm -hmm. is, you know, it's like, I'm glad I live in a world where this is a film. <laughs> well, I, I think my favorite part is the job line and paid for this. Yes. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. So um, I'll tell you uh, in all seriousness, um, the, the areas that I am uh, the most drawn to is actually almost as, um, as a composer. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the aspects, is, well, yeah, John Lennon uh, paid for this. George Harrison, I think, had actually learned about El Topo. I think that's who, who found it first. Uh, but uh, a lot of the score was was uh, composed by Don Cherry. Yeah, Don and, Cherry, the brown yeah, race and, guy. And he, uh, you know, um, for, for those that are listening who aren't familiar with his work, um, he was the trumpet player for... Uh, well, for Ornette Coleman, and it's just very involved in the free improvisation music scene. So um, there's actually a lot of very, uh, just on a, a, a very like spiritual level, my favorite music to play is in that vein, um, you know, of Sun Ra, Ornette Coleman, uh, Don Cherry, where it's very blues heavy, but cosmic 
oriented mm -hmm. improvisation. Um, and so, so, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm very much a, uh, a, a synesthesiac, you know, like I, I get a lot of physical sensations from, from, uh, stimulants. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's one reason I love, uh, the, the, the very, um, organic, but kind of hard to listen to, uh, free jazz movement, because mm -hmm. there's so much sonic texture, you know, living in the moment and organically shifting mm -hmm. that is very present in this movie the whole time in, in the soundtrack. Um, now these, this is an adult understanding, you know, this is me as a middle-aged composer, mm -hmm. you know, blah, blah, blah. But I'm positive that those things were happening when I saw this the first time, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in, in that unconscious level. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, uh, I, I'm going to mess up his last name, but uh, George Deirdreth um, uh, was, I think he was the, he was the teacher of Ren Rene Demal, who, um, who a lot of the story of the Holy Mountain is based off of mm -hmm. um, from oh, his Georgia. book uh yeah yeah thank you um but but Gurdjieff is is a composer as well as a mystic um you know Sufi mystic he wrote a series of piano pieces um that are uh it's um I'm gonna mess it up it's hymns and dirge or meditation and dirge but it, it's a series of piano pieces that are just completely um essential in regards to uh, to to meditative music and and mm -hmm. early early to mid twentieth century classical music, so mm -hmm. there's just a lot of musical things going on in this film, which I actually think I'm drawn to uh, the structure, how it's it really is a three act opera, if if you mm -hmm. you know want to think of it that way, mm -hmm. um, and it's very driven by by the sound as opposed to dialogue. Um, so that's kind of the baseline thing that I'm drawn to. Um, the second thing uh, is that the whole experience feels like how life is in an actual dream state, mm -hmm. how you kind of go from one place to another and like things are confusing, but you're sort of floating along, like the story just takes you mm -hmm. as it goes. And you know the the so so I, I I love just on on the actual visual element as well as the structural element that this might be one of the most accurate dream uh, sequences that you know <laughs> that I've ever seen at least at least when I was especially at the time when I saw this uh, where mm -hmm. it was like holy shit this is this is exactly what dreams feel like um, where you are in a space and you just transport and you witness things. And um, to get a, a, a bit deeper into to some of this uh, particular angle. Um, so I'm actually in the midst of, uh, of getting my second level training for, it's a form of music therapy called guided imagery and music. And mm -hmm. A lot of that is um, based on the teachings and, and research from Helen Bonney, who was a, a colleague of Abraham Maslow, famous for the Maslow hierarchy of needs, or Carl Rogers, um, but also a lot of the, uh, the um, early psychedelic um, researchers like Timothy Leary, um, even, even you know, Terrence McKenna, and, and, and you know, the sort of more pop culture uh, oriented psychological thinkers. But anyways, um, there is a lot of insight into, so, so the way GIM works is it's a form of psychotherapy um, that you need specialized training to practice where you get your person, uh, we call them the traveler, into a meditative state, um, either through deep breathing or um, it, it, well, mostly deep breathing, but uh, then we start to utilize um, visualization, mm -hmm. uh, sort of like you know meditating by a forest or meditating by a lake, so something like that. And there's really um, specifically chosen music, instrumental music that we then utilize to create a soundscape to guide 
the person through their visualizations and um and and what it ends up what 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 the process is just to kind of give a, a an idea on, on how the, the neuroscience of this works is um you know when you're driving like you get into your car and you drive like you know from your house to the store and you get out and you don't actually remember driving mm -hmm. there at all right but yet you still were you know staying in the lane you still followed all the traffic laws um mm -hmm. you know you did all these sorts of things um that is uh, it, it, that's where our mind kind of goes when we're in these non-ordinary states. It's, it's the, the daydreaming space. Mm -hmm. And so um, what guided imagery and music is, is really helping a person get into a daydreaming state and then using the music as sort of a container to help explore where the person's mind is going. All of that to say, after, you know, like I guess post-production, post-session, um, you utilize a lot of uh, the metaphorical images that that come out, and so um, there's a part of this film where it just it really, uh, especially at this particular um, area of my uh, my therapy training, um, that is just really really insightful into imaging and metaphor. How it doesn't necessarily have to have. I don't necessarily care what Jodorowsky necessarily like intended with his projection of it but I know like that I'm getting certain um sensations and experiences through some form of metaphor um when when watching when watching this film um and and the thing that I'm getting that the critique is is on religion and capitalism which are two things I love critiquing uh, so <laughs> so um so uh yeah, yeah. So, so that that would be the the second layer. So, you know, the first layer is I think there's a lot of musical experiences, and then there's the second layer is that it is very dreamlike um, in its use of metaphor. Um, so, uh, and then and then the third part is I really do love like uh, it, it's gotten less. You know, now that I'm like apparently like a functioning adult and like a husband and a father and all all that mm -hmm. stuff. You know, there is definitely a point in my life where it was like, "Hey, want to see this movie?" <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, just put it on just to just to get responses from people. But that that has uh, much uh, that that has less become the reason, uh, or become the reason much less. Uh, so yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's interesting you mention it as like a space, and I think that's where like the film works the best. Like I think the weakest parts of the films are the part or the film is the part in the middle with all the narration where he's kind of doing these like kind of uh, uh, not not all of them but a lot of fairly obvious surrealist juxtapositions like the the guitar with the gun on it um, and a few other things and it starts to feel a bit more like uh, yeah it feels more satirical than dreamlike and then and then it gets back into the dream thing when once it's once they're ascending the mountain kind of, kind of towards the end um well and the metaphor definitely disappears like in the in the second half like it's sort mm -hmm. of like oh this is about war oh this is about mass produced art oh this is about the police <laughs> state <laughs> like yeah Right, and I, I think that kind of speaks to like how surrealist film, like I, I think be, because of so much of surrealism is based on indefinite meaning in images uh, or, you know, in, in whatever medium that surrealism is taking place in, that like the, the only real way to judge it properly is just by the impact of the images. Like, does it stick with you almost like, a, like iconography, I guess? for lack of a better word, right? Because um, they're, like he says himself at the end of the movie, they're not really going to make it coherent. The only real thread going through besides this this kind of like very nebulous story is just this one guy, these are the images coming out of it. It's like a dream journal almost because of the, the fact that it, it's so disorganized. Um, I, I mean, it, it's fairly organized, but like the, I guess thematically it's very disorganized. There, there's mm -hmm. like motifs that it keeps coming back to, but it's not necessarily building towards um, 
some kind of momentum with those things. It, it's just sort of like, uh, it's almost like self-generated Rorschach tests. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, ex exactly. It's like, what, uh, what, it, what do you see? Right. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, just, just to actually also put this part out there, one thing that um, I'm actually very bothered by the movie, I was when I was younger, but um, am much, much, much more bothered by now is the clear deaths of animals. Um, oh, the dog you know, fighting team? Yeah, and like even the blowing up of the frogs and lizards, like, yeah. um, you know, that that's something, you know, I, I definitely, uh, I, I wouldn't support a, a film that had something like in this if it had been made like in my lifetime. There's mm. something about the fact that it was a different era um, that I can kind of accept the, the, the animal abuse on camera. Um, but, uh, but that, that actually is something that um, I'm finding less and less an ability to self-justify um, mm -hmm. as, as I'm getting older, like, it's kind of like, oh, all right, that's, this is great. <laughs> like, you know? Um, yeah. So, so that's actually one area I do have a pretty major problem with, um, mm -hmm. you know, at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think like some of the parts of the movie that didn't necessarily hold up as well as, I mean, although on the whole, I think it, it held together really well. Um, that, yeah, it kind of came back to that like transgressive culture as like, if I can't think of what the next move I'm going to make making this movie is, go for the most transgressive image I can think of. And because there had been such a kind of prohibition on like sexual and violent imagery in film for so long, I feel like a lot of films in that late 60s, early 70s period, um, yeah, there's, there's like this kind of release just like uh, you know if, if you want to have like ridiculous kind of cartoonish violence in a, a live action movie you can do that now um you know you can have people running around naked doing this that and the other thing um you, you know and, and just kind of the more shocking it is the more damaging it is to the the kind of perceived prior regime and it's sort of interesting that all popped up right around that because i've been thinking a lot lately about like what is counterculture and like, what are the kind of necessary preconditions for counterculture to exist? And, and the major one that I've kind of come to is that you need to have like a fairly unified mono, monoculture that it's countering. And so it seems kind of interesting that like the, the big counterculture boom happens right around when most households finally get televisions. Um, and yeah, and I, I think with, with a lot of the art from that period, the, the stuff that doesn't necessarily hold up quite as well as where they're kind of using the, the transgressive energy in, in place of judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, although at the same time, that's kind of like, a, um, that's like a thing you can only get from these kinds of movies, like these problems and the, the kind of images associated with them were fresh enough where there is this like very kind of genuine unfiltered outrage in a lot of them that I think gets replaced with with something a bit more distance and maybe cynical in later films even the surrealist ones and yeah. random. I don't know <laughs> 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 I don't like canceling <laughs> yeah. well it's it's um y you know there this this is something uh I, I've been thinking a lot about um just like you know some some of the the punk bands in the you know early six or late sixties you know all the way through mm -hmm. the eighties would use fascist imagery mm -hmm. um, intentionally for the shock value you know like crass, oh yeah I mean David like, Bowie did at one point yeah, yeah yeah and like man that would not go over well and I mm -hmm. I mean it's actually like really disturbing to see now like it's like oh god y'all had like you fucking idiots like have no idea like <laughs> that there are like active fascists still like mm. <laughs> like it's could, could you have a band named joy division today yeah i i, right. I uh i mean you could well I, you could I, barely have a band called joy division back then like they didn't yeah they didn't last for super long the, yeah um, yeah i i uh i 
I, I think you could have one. I just think that mm. the consequences would would come to, you know, like uh, the the real suffering that that comes from a name like that would would come to fruition. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because I mean, it's it's uh, like, you know, one, one thing we are seeing in in this film uh, is that like, yes, it is, um, you know, fighting against a certain certain established order and a certain certain um, power dynamic, but it still is like clearly a patriarchal film. Mm -hmm. Like it still, uh, you know, exploits exploits women like the, the amount of boobs in the movie is like you know just not it's non-stop and um it, you know just the even like the, there's that one arts dealer like where there's the it's so this is what this is the complex reality of the movie because as i'm trying to say this problematic scene you know i'm also kind of smiling because it uh, but the the arts dealer when when there's the robot that they have to make love to and like his mistress, oh yeah and he's just like actually feeling her up yeah yeah but like like the mistress is able to like do it where the the driver is not and I, like I, I think that scene is hilarious like you know as like just a an observer but I also do realize that you know it's like wow like this woman's only job is to please him like mm -hmm. you know because and Joe Dorosky chose this like you know this wasn't uh this isn't a commentary on like you know this horrible you know patriarch of 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 the art dealer it's like well you get that kind of like mirror image of it afterwards with the like mm -hmm. pool of male secretaries that are all naked that look like uh they look like all those swimmers around jane russell and gentlemen prefer blondes <laughs> right. in like a few minutes <laughs> yeah um, but but at the same time that's kind of like uh I, you get the sense that he chose it for the mirroring more than like, oh, okay, this is the same thing going on in both sides. Mm -hmm. And even there, like, like a, a both sides do this kind of thing probably isn't appropriate in 1973, much less now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Although, I mean, like, the people that I know that were around there, I, I know a, a few people that were in Newsreel and uh, back then... And I mean, they all kind of describe it as like Fritz the cat, like supposedly, like as far as I can tell from the people that were around like Chicago and in San Francisco in the six in the late sixties, the most accurate document of that was Fritz the cat, just like it was a lot of kind of trust fund kids running around looking for free sex mm -hmm. um, or, you know, just sort of like, uh, like Robert Kramer supposedly would he'd sit around in the newsreel office like holding a holding this uh like empty pistol and like asking the women to get him coffee like doing this shake with a little bit or whatever uh, yeah i mean it, it was i mean I, I guess that was also the time when there was like a, a distinct branch of feminism that was basically saying like you know free yourself by getting a maid right <laughs> like um so it was just a different time it was a very mm -hmm. different time yeah. So yeah, I, I I definitely think that there are um the you know the the movie has been uh has not held up in a lot of ways. Um that being said, I still think it does give insight into the culture of, of the time that that it's like, yes, this may have been a step out of um you know, or a, a reaction to McCarthyism, like, mm -hmm. and, and uh, sort of the leave it to Beaver-esque um, whitewashing of, of the real world. Uh, but it's also still very obvious that, like, there's a lot of work that the world still mm -hmm. needs to do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we do, oh, uh, I, I, was somebody going to say something? I heard No, of? no, no, I was just agreeing. Yeah, it, it's like um, we do a lot of silent films. Uh, my wife and I, we do silent film accompanying, and and you know mm -hmm. some of it is uh, you know movies from from the twenties. And um, this is like I, I know this is an anecdotal piece, but uh, but like first and foremost, like I always think of our audiences because it's like generally a Brooklyn hipster audience, and every time I hear about 
the quote unquote, you know, liberals war on free speech, I think of like, you know, like we do some pretty edgy shit and have never ever uh, <laughs> dealt with, with censorship or it, but anyways, it's, it's like, you know, these are the same people who are freaking out about uh, Mr. Potato Head still existing. Yeah. Um, like, <laughs> but, uh, but any, any, anyways, um, I, I, all, all, all of that to say is like, we, we watch these movies and there are some moments that are, you can just feel the entire theater just like feel uncomfortable. <laughs> and then the scene passes and like the you know movie goes on and and it's not like you know it's not like we're doing some of these films just to be like you know like all right snowflakes can't handle it like it's like it's like yeah this this is clearly like a snapshot of time like it's like we can't pretend like this stuff wasn't happening now i'm never going to defend it like i'm not going to say like oh it was a different time it's okay it's like yeah, it was a different time and it was fucked up then and it's yeah. fucked up now and we know it. Um, so, so don't mind the black face. It was okay then. Yeah, yeah, it was fine. It was fine. Um, man, I had a, a discussion with, um, I'll just say older family members about the term, <clears throat> the term colored uh, <laughs> recently. And uh, it was brought up that that's actually, it wasn't an offensive term because I, uh, the, it was used at, from um, as a term for endearment from in, for emancipated slaves, and it was like, oh. um, that's that's a problem. Like, <laughs> like, like in a weird way, that almost seems like one of the least problematic ones because of the fact that it's not it's not presuming the person is from a, a country of origin. It's not presuming right it's sort of like like person of color is is sort of like just, just like a passive phrasing um although like i i guess are, are you talking about like like color i'm talking about the 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 or, are earlier you just talking about one word yeah just the oh, that one oh, word okay, that's different. yeah 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 right. yeah and it just it was it was really wild just experiencing the pushback where it was just like, oh yeah, this is a term of endearment from emancipated slaves. And it was like, <laughs> emancipated what? <laughs> like, it's like, yeah. So it's like, you see the, 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 the only reason that word existed is because there were people who were enslaved. Like, right. you know, um, yeah. Well, that, and, that's the only reason the Kelly Blue Book exists. Because of emancipated I, uh, slaves? No, because of the, the slave trade. The, the first place where you see used car style depreciations or in uh account books for slave traders oh my god you're kidding yeah you, you, you didn't know that no yeah Ooh. yeah that's that's where like automobile depreciation all comes from uh, i'm i i, I want to make sure i'm correct on this but i think it's the family that owns panera bread and Krispy cream i i forget what what all they own but i i believe i just want to like confirm to make sure it's it's true but now i want to look this um, up <laughs> yeah I, I i believe that um the the owners uh actually like gained a lot of their initial wealth uh through nazi slave labor um so yeah mm -hmm. um let me i mean me ibm got a huge bump from that mm-hmm Hey, that's why we have Volkswagen, right? <laughs> <laughs> the people's car. Yeah. People's car. Um... Well, so so yeah, so that's you know that that's that's my uh, review of the Holy Mountain. How <laughs> I, I yeah, still I'm... thoroughly enjoy the film, but am, like definitely have some really cringy shit to get through. Um, well, I'm trying to because there's definitely there's a lot of stuff in there where I was like. I could see echoes of it and other things, uh, you know, it definitely had an in, impact, like the last scene where it, it cuts to just, okay, it's the movie crew. Uh, Shuji Toriyama does that three years later in a pastoral to die in the country, like almost the exact same thing, except he's doing like a time shift too. Uh, the other thing was when he shits in the, um, like the thing and it turns into gold, you ever see that Mr. Show sketch, The Burgundy Loaf, where oh, the guy goes to the super fancy restaurant and they won't let him leave to go to the bathroom to take a shit? 
they give him this velvet lined box and then they mail it to him <laughs> after his dinner. And, and it's just like the waiter saying, no, 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 this place is far too fancy for bathrooms. Sit, sit. And he's just like adjusting the chair so that the guy can shed. And, and anyway, that was that. That was a thing. I, kinda, I wonder if there's a connection. I, I, don't, I don't know if you need specific inspiration to come up with the idea of somebody shitting in a box or like, like if you really need to draw a genealogy <laughs> like artistic rep representations of shitting in a box. So I found, sorry, I found this. This is going back. So the Jab Holding Company or Joe Beckisser is a German conglomerate headquartered in Luxembourg that includes investments in companies operating the areas of in the areas of consumer goods, forestry, coffee, luxury, fashion, health, animal health, and fast food. The so companies they own um valley shoe cody inc pete's coffee caribou coffee jacob dow's egbert's einstein's bagel espresso house Krispy cream panera prep a manger um so i'm just going to scroll down to the nazi history part of the article um yeah so in march 2019 a german newspaper revealed that albert ryman senior and his son albert ryman jr were enthusiastic supporters of adolf hitler and the nazi party well before they took power and profited from forced labor in their industrial chemical company in southern germany and in their home the re revelations sparked ethical questions about consumer support for companies that owe their success in part to the historical use of, of forced labor Two months later, several of remains uh, of the Raymonds revealed to the New York Times that their mother, Emile Landecker, Albert Jr.'s mistress, baptized as a Catholic like her mother, was the daughter of Alfred Landecker, a Jewish man deported to the Ispica ghetto in 1942. His ultimate fate is unknown, although many Jews sent to Izvika were held there pending transport to Belzec and Salvador extermination camps. They have renamed the family foundation after him, doubled its budget to 25 million uh, to fund projects that honor the victims of Holocaust and Nazism. So all that came out after it was outed that they had made a very, very large amount of money um, on on Nazi slave labor. But then um, just even on the Wikipedia, uh, it says number of employees, they have seven, <laughs> seven employees. So, uh, so yeah, so um, I forget why the fuck was, why was this even being brought up? What? <laughs> it was something Hello, about Panera. Yeah. The, the world needs to know. Yeah. Should it, I pause it this, go back and the... <laughs> Um, no, like we were talking about Panera and, but why did, how did Panera come out of the Holy Mountain? Um, I don't know. Yeah. The, the Krispy Kreme thing, okay, it, it's <laughs> reminding me of this, like, oh my God, this might be the most inappropriate thing that anyone ever said to me ever. So I guess trigger warning. Should I hit pause? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't ahead. know, but. We can decide yeah. later whether to edit it out. <laughs> So I was going to a therapist when I was 16 and, and I saw, like, maybe you saw this story about like, there was a German cannibal and he would go on these internet forums where you, uh, like it would be people that had sexual fantasies about eating people, meeting people who had sexual fantasies about being eaten. Okay. So like, yeah, I remember this. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. And, and so the, the guy consents, he eats him in his backyard and, and I was reading up on it at the time, and it was apparently like these cannibalism forums, it's like very specific to Germany. There's like 30,000 people in Germany on these forums, which is, is like more people than live in the town that I'm living in right now. Uh -huh. And um, as I go to the therapist and, and he said, and I, and I said, you know, what is it with like German culture and cannibalism? And, and he's like, well, you, you know, like before the Holocaust, Hitler promised dinner on every German table. And, wow. Uh, the therapist. <laughs> <laughs> Did you uh, go back to that therapist? I think two or three times. Wow. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was, was a little build up there, but hopefully I, I didn't over oversell that. Uh, no, no, you uh you sold it just 
just right. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so Krispy Kreme donuts. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just still. I'm. I'm just still trying to process that a therapist would say that to you. I mean, I guess the conversation kind of starts. And he was the good one too. Wow. He was the one that didn't get the HIPAA complaint. <laughs> what, what what um what well, was the hippie complaint it, it was know? it was the long journey up the up the, the therapist mountain <laughs> it was a very long journey up the therapist mountain oh, at least God. holy mountain has a happy ending sort of <laughs> happy, holy mountain doesn't end uh, end in any hippie complaints so you could say that the moral of the Holy Mountain is basically that the real hero is you. <laughs> Ooh, because they do. Hey, hey, the 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 alchemist turns around and faces me, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and that's Jodorowsky himself. He he is the alchemist. So yeah, the filmmaker. He's letting you the... know. Yeah, he's letting you know right, that right, the movie right. is actually about you. Um, it's not the movie about me that I expected. The movie about me that I expected, um, but I guess that's about the movie you, about, you about me that I'm getting. Me. So, I di I didn't. I, I guess I don't really understand myself very well. I see myself in a very different light than others do. Yeah. See, like it's weird because the moment we got on the Zoom call, I saw you covered in tarantulas, um, <laughs> with with the metal thing squirting colored liquid out, out you know, out, out of your eyes. Um, oh, okay. Oh, that's just my uh, Zoom filter. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. I mean, for all I know, when I shit, it does turn to gold because, like, I don't see it after, like, I don't keep in touch. <laughs> I, I hit the flusher, it's gone. I don't know what happened. You know, it could be like, you know, it could be vacation in Margaritaville. You know, it's it's just like. Well, wasn't that a that's Roger's superpower on American Dad? Right. So he can take a shit. No, that he shits gold and he gold <laughs> in the, um, golden jewels. That's gotta hurt. Yeah, <laughs> there's a whole there's a whole story. That, like every I don't know, like twice a season, there's a there's a little sequence that shows up that seems to have nothing to do with the rest of the movie, and it's about like people finding this this big giant gold and jewel filled thing, and they each go they they kill other people for it, and somebody else gets it. And anyways, I'm sorry, this is a total sidetrack. This has nothing to do with Holy Mountain. <laughs> but it um, does. But it, it, maybe, that that maybe it does. Maybe it does. Maybe yet another uh, another uh, uh, person or team that was inspired by this movie. I also do appreciate like like um the, you know the art stealer scene where uh there's all the the butts getting painted on and they're just <laughs> sitting on the conveyor belt like like there there are all these sort of like gem gem scenes like that you know just uh yeah it's it's like man like i would that's not would that far off them. either because that's like what this movie came out like 10 years before andy warhol had people like literally pissing on pieces of metal yeah for shows like i don't know i i i could see damien hurst like I don't know, I'm just imagining that formaldehyde shark, but it's just a butt, it's just a decaying butt in like a fish tank. Who did uh, watch this movie at the time? Uh, Who did watch this movie when it came out? John it, Lennon. It was, oh. uh, it was um, at the 1973 uh, Keynes Film Festival. Yeah. Oh, no kidding. Really? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Do you know if it won any prizes there? I don't know. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, um, I don't know. Like, there, there is a lot of interesting, um, interesting elements just to, uh, you know, J Jodorowsky's interest um, in, into various mystical practices. Mm -hmm. Like, I know that I know that they were um, they brought on oh, what's his uh, Oscar? Yeah, Oscar Icazo, um, who. Uh, he he was having them practice uh, concepts from the Kabbalah and from Kabbalah and, and um, the I Ching and and like various like Sufi practices and mm. yoga practices and Zen practices and um, I know that they also <laughs> were instructed to take um, to take acid 
and shrooms like while prepping <laughs> for the movie um i think they i think oh okay yeah sorry i'm just kind of scanning through yeah they they um lived together for like three months before <laughs> before filming really um yeah yeah the whole cast and crew just doing like really wild um spiritual training to to get uh-huh. in the right mindset for this and you know that there's there's again it's like looking through the modern lens uh like there there are some problematic issues with that <laughs> duh um mm-hmm. but i do appreciate that it's um that there is kind of an openness uh that joe Dorosky was was attempting to tap into um you know uh, and i mean there, there's like a tradition of that in like carl dreyer did something pretty similar to that in preparation for shooting passion of joan of arc Mm-hmm. he had like the uh was it the entire cast and crew built like this enormous boat that's not in a single shot in the movie for three months and and dryer later said that he never meant to use the boat he was just using <laughs> the construction project of the boat but yeah like that can get into weird terror because there's also like like captain beefheart for trout mask replica right because he can't play any instruments well, he definitely can't play any instruments now, but he couldn't play any instruments back then either. And uh, and he basically just started a cult in this house, right? And trained, and, and then he he just like kept banging at a piano until the people figured out what he was telling him to play. And like a lack of ambition is probably the only thing that really separates Captain Beefheart from some like the Source family in, in a weird way. <laughs> like he, he was looking into like brain uh like brainwashing techniques and stuff and then he, he you know he comes out with trout mask replica and it's like all right that's that's all i needed this for you're free to go yeah that 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 is like um just to kind of get further into the the like very obvious problematic elements like <laughs> you know i i would definitely take pause to you know any kind of gig where it was like, all right, all right, man, like all, all you got to do is, you know, come out here for three months and we're just going to do drugs and a lot of spiritual stuff. Like, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> like you know, that that's definitely, um, you know, something to definitely be on the lookout for on, on things not to well, be. There's like a thin line between like this and the fire festival. Right. I, w- I was actually going to go this and the the Manson family, uh, which, <laughs> but but yes yes to both. <laughs> um, oh man! All right, yeah, so when there's we... like other movies that were shot kind of like this that did not turn out this well. Like I, I think part of what's so impressive about this movie is how many movies are like it that that just like suck. <laughs> like, like, do you ever see the Last Picture Show with uh, Dennis Hopper? Or not the last picture, the last movie. TV. The last no. picture show is a decent movie. So it's like, so I hate Easy Rider. This one's even worse than Easy Rider. It's just like, give Dennis <laughs> Hopper a bunch of drugs. Easy Rider was a big hit. So he's got, you know, a budget and backing and all this stuff. And it, it, it's, it's so bad. It's like a really bad two hour student film but with a lot of money and just like naked people and drugs. Mm -hmm. And you can tell he's trying to do something like this, but it kind of proves that it's not just like you eat some acid, write some stuff down and then go get naked in the desert. Like there is some skill to this. Right. Like there, there, there is, there is actual craft that's shown in in the film, even, even though it is like a fucking weird 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 experience um well i you know i'm actually uh i have um okay wow this honestly wasn't planned um but i happen to have uh three jodorowsky books on my bookshelf <laughs> right me. just by confidence um, yeah, like, no uh we we literally just moved and um I, I haven't like quite organized my books yet. And the bookshelf behind me was uh, it was all visual, um, but uh, like I, I haven't actually like made any order of it yet. But but yeah, so there's uh, Psycho Magic, um, which is the, the transformative power of shamanic psychotherapy. Uh, 
Then there is um, the manual of psychomagic, which is the practice, um, the practice of shamanic psychotherapy. And then uh, there is the way of the tarot, the spiritual teacher in the cards. Huh. And um, one of the things with Jodorowsky that's interesting, he, he considers himself um, an athe atheist mystic. Um, mm. And, you know, just to like, just to put all this out there for, um, for the certification board of music therapy, I do not consider uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky to be a, uh, a credentialed psychotherapist in any way, shape or form. However, uh, <laughs> some of his ideas are pretty interesting um, just in regards to, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like navigating this like on the spot. So, so be, be wary of, of how I stumble mm -hmm. and possibly fall off. But, um, you know, it, it's like, I don't necessarily think any of these books uh, offer any insights regarding, um, regarding actual therapeutic processes or, or um, mechanisms that we would necessarily use in a healing, in, in a healing modality mm -hmm. uh, when, when doing any form of therapy. However, there is some insights into um, into some of the older uh, healing modalities, such as mindfulness meditation, or uh, even various shamanic practices with um, with psychoactive substances, mm -hmm. that is starting to be re um, re studied and re researched. Like um, right now, there's actually a lot of really interesting um, research on positive effects of of psychedelic mushrooms uh, right, right. on on specifically people uh, in palliative and hospice care, um, and it's all qualitative research. It's not quantitative, so it's not um, it's not really uh, measurable in regards to tangible evidence. But the people who have involved have been involved with the studies. Um, well, you know, on a scale of one to ten, like ten being ultimate existential dread, when they're that close to death, they'll mark like an eight or a seven and after the psychedelic experience uh they find that a, uh, the majority of people are around like a two or a three um and on a follow-up um a week out a month out and six months out they're still at that level um so there is just some promise uh in regards to some of these these uh old, older modalities um and applying them through a new scientific uh understanding um mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and so anyways, all of that to say that I think Jodorowsky has an interesting take on, um, on the use of uh, like tarot reading and the use mm -hmm. of, um, of psychedelic substances where he's not speaking as a religious practitioner and he's not speaking as a mental health professional, but he is speaking as sort of, you know, this mystical artistic lens that gives some interesting insights into uh, into working with with clients. So like, for instance, um, like I don't do tarot card reading with my with my clients, like meaning that I will not do like a like a, a psychic reading or anything like that. What, However, what if they paid extra? Well, I mean, you know, maybe, but <laughs> no, uh, but, but what, what I will use is tarot card to be a foundation um, for, for discussion points. So it's like, um, and, th and this, this does go back to Carl Jung and, and Wilhelm Reich and some of the early psycho, psycho an, um, analysts where you use some of these archetypal um, imaging images to, to help sort of guide the person where they're actually at like it's like you know if, if you pull out the demon card it doesn't mean you're possessed by a demon it's like okay so you pulled this card out what is your reflection and you can use that as sort of a a, a base to to begin um more more uh, i guess efficient um efficient therapeutic uh interventions and so anyways yeah uh he does have some interesting um sort of artistic uh artistic perspectives on uh through a contemporary lens on some of these older practices yeah it's interesting
Yeah, and legit did not plan on having the three books <laughs> directly. Uh, well, I mean, it's it's like it's funny that you called Ron and I at seven because we were we were already planning on recording a podcast tonight, but we didn't have a guest. <laughs> but it was totally coincidental that you just happened to show up. Yeah, <laughs> this is. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, it's sort of like cheers the the podcast. Just whoever walks in is on is on the show. Yeah, since house parties <laughs> the house party is gone, all we do is I set up I set up Zoom, I take mm. the link, I post it on Twitter, I post it on Facebook, and if anybody shows up, so so thanks for stopping by. No, I, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Wait, did you say house party is gone? House party is gone. Yeah, I I had I had a very eventful pandemic on house party and now house party is gone what what happened to the party at the house <laughs> they they just they got rid of it i i don't know maybe they're gonna roll it into Fortnite. Huh. Well, I think they, the reason they the reason epic games bought house party was to eventually use the technology so you could have like a live chat room waiting room thing for Fortnite because yeah, it's the same company on both of them they said something like, but we've got other stuff in the works. Right. So we don't need house party anymore. <laughs> they didn't and make it, it what like, that other stuff is, just stuff. House party uh, was the only thing keeping the upstate New York people from like attacking each other. Like as soon as house party went down, there's just been like drama. <laughs> Wait, there was already <laughs> plenty of drama before. <laughs> well, there was a lot of drama, but it was like contained on the internet. Oh. <laughs> I could like clean my house and put it on, and it was sort of like my own little coast to coast AM. <laughs> that horrible thing. I don't know. I, I I get a lot of calls from people that talk for a really long time, and like <laughs> I don't mind it, but I like to do other things. So that's like I put them on the stereo. And you get that nice kind of like warm, you know, they're going through the tubes, right? And it sounds like I'm driving at night, it's the radio or whatever. And usually if I check in every 15 minutes or so, like they understand that I'm still on the phone. Okay. If you, if you get on and go, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. Go <laughs> yeah, yeah. And wow. it's a lot more funny because I, I used to get that and I would like, because now I can hear it and I can cook pasta. It used to be I would just put the phone down, cook pasta, and then go aha uh -huh, as soon as I was done cooking the pasta or whatever. And if you had multiple people uh, multiple people on house party, then you didn't have to worry about saying uh huh. Yeah, yeah, like like and, and you, if you get all the all the people and and they had Uno, you could play Uno for free. Yeah, yeah. You played so much Uno. I participated twice. Wow. Well, I, I played so much Uno. Well, I guess <laughs> the two times you were on, all we did was play digital Uno. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't need to be part of the drama. The Uno was good. The drama was better hearing it secondhand. Dorian, as an expert, what are your feelings on Uno? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's definitely, um, it's a game. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's a game. People play the game. You know, you're um, making some controversial assertions here. <laughs> So I have a question. When did when did house party uh, when did house party end? Uh, middle of last month, like probably middle oh, of October. Okay, I thought it was going to be like January fifth, two thousand twenty one. House party ends. <laughs> the capital gets. <laughs> no, well they didn't put a specific date and time, so it was like still there for a few. I thought it was going off on October first. Um, I can't say, I mean, it's probably been good for my sleep that house party is gone. Cause I would be on there till like seven in the morning sometimes, which was like not a good life habit. <laughs> but, uh, I'm not adulting. I, I don't have like a kid or a house or anything. Well, I, I live in a house, but I'm, I'm just aging. <laughs> <laughs> We've you've taken got, got um... millions of kids. <laughs> I'm just repeating myself until I fall apart. We've taken a number of those like online BuzzFeed style quizzes to see you know, mm. what generation are you? And um Dan comes out pretty regularly as a boomer. Um <laughs> Okay, okay. So he's not okay, kidding boomer. about how, how much he's aging. Or or it has already aged, really. Wow. Well, yeah, my this all used to be hair. 
instead of just like <laughs> widow's peak. <laughs> <laughs> So what what do you think uh, the most boomer opinion you have is? Uh, stereo separates. I, I I vastly vastly prefer stereo separates to like sound bars and things like that. Um, what other ones? Uh, You're cranky. I am cranky. <laughs> Although that's not real a generational thing. No, that's usually more like like what I've eaten. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know what what generation are you like spiritually? Oh, spiritually. I mean, I think I'm. Are you um, also a boomer? I no. I I think I'm like. I think I'm like very very millennial. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> like like every part. Like yeah. Like oh man. I, I mean, I'm literally a millennial, and I I think I I think I like embody. <laughs> being a millennial in every, every aspect the positives and the negatives uh yeah, yeah. um you're the pic- I, you're, I say you're the picture boy for millennials picture yeah boy, is that the right word i, I poster I, poster poster boy post, i kind of like picture boy better yeah like, okay you're the picture boy. <laughs> yeah 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 um but like that being said it's like i'm having a weird uh weird thing right now my, my relationship is changing with gen x um because I used to always think like Gen X sounded so cool. Mm. Um, and, it is. and it like, does. It, Sorry, yeah. go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's a cool sounding uh, generation. Um, uh, but I'm like, I've been stuck in too many situations where technology has needed to be used. Uh-huh. And, um, and uh, I've actually found that the Gen X folks that I've worked with have had have struggled more with the tech than the boomers. Interesting. Which, wow. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, like, um, because it's like it's like the boomers, like they they've like adapted, you know, like like they know the world is different, but like the the Gen Xers, like they still think, um, like Terminator is like you know the most innovative. Uh, <laughs> film ever made, uh, <laughs> or, or like. Wait, how did you know that Ron thought that? <laughs> yeah, it's um, it, it's it's it's. I'm so I'm having like a, a weird like like just sort of like transition moment, and it's like you know I'm, I'm not sure how to process it. Um, Can you give an example of a, a Gen Xer and their tech problem? Now I'm really curious. Mm. All right. So in case anyone I know listens to this, I'm going to be as vague as possible, okay, but okay. still being specific. Uh, mm, 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 mm. Um, for instance, uh, let's say you're working in a space where there is Zoom being used. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's say zoom is being used to give presentations of an entire body of work um, from students throughout the year and uh, let's say on this graduation day these presentations that students had worked at all year uh getting ready to do their their um sharing and keep in mind we've used zoom every week for like you know a whole pandemic at this point um and so these videos of these projects are shared um but the sound is not shared uh-huh. and so it's just um i'm gonna do a visual representation <laughs> and and uh like for like 20 minutes and and like trying to just like like you know it's like hey um can we share the sound oh i i think i did share the sound no, but we're not hearing the sound. <laughs> no, no, no. I, are you sure it's not on your computer? Yes, I'm positive. <laughs> like, so. There are 10 of us here watching. None of us can hear it. It yeah. is not 10 of us screwing, you know, with screwed up computers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, see, I, I like that you use the number 10 because there were like 50 people. Oh, wow. Watching. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's 50. That's 50 people that have their computers set, set improperly. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that that's an example of okay. of a tech tech situation. Um, that uh, and it, you know, it, it the the I guess the part that I I just found interesting was the the pushback of the like 
like this the sound's not sharing and it was like oh no 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 that's it's on your computer and it was like no yeah. no it's not uh <laughs> yeah so that that's an example okay um, okay no, that's a good example i actually um uh when i have had to share sound i forget to click on the share sound uh uh, uh, uh checkbox um it took me so i can use like zoom the basic stuff with no problem um but and i even i've told other people about uh, do you know if you set yourself on mute if you hit the space bar it'll unmute, unmute you temporarily uh yes so, all right all right because i always have myself on mute i never you know even if i'm participating in the conversation i'll usually be on mute except when i want to say something um but it took me three and a half years to re to to realize that there's uh, that you could do reactions. You know the little reactions button at the bottom. Oh, I yeah, know. there you go. <laughs> Folks at home, what you can't see is that Dorian just gave me the thumbs up and a high five. Oh, and Dan just did a a party uh, a party hat. There's there's like some confetti <laughs> coming out of it. Whatever. Yeah, let's see. I'm gonna do one. Which one am I gonna do? There. Now I'm laughing so hard that tears are coming out of my eyes. So look at that reactions. Oh, no, a snake. It's a snake. <laughs> uh. um, yeah, so it took, it, wait, wait, did you guys know about reactions? Ron, Ron, you're not actually crying. You're, you're not actually laughing so hard that I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> Dorian's not actually a snake. <laughs> well, I was able, I, 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 I used a reaction that looked like I was laughing so hard with tears coming out of my eyes so that I wouldn't have to actually physically laugh. So you're outsourcing. I'm outsourcing. I'm outsourcing it to my avatar. Yeah. Wait, so did you, did you guys know about reactions before this? I did. All right, Dorian, did. you did. On, on Zoom? Yeah. No. All right. Well, there you go. The Gen X taught one millennial something. <laughs> the, the boomer millennial. No, so I'm solidly Gen X, but I show up on those quizzes a lot as being like a, um, a, a, a confusing mixture of Gen X and millennial. Yeah. So uh, I, I have like boomer cultural reference points and a millennial bank account. <laughs> so basically what I'm saying is chick magnet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously. Hmm. Yeah, it's... um. I, I actually have like a ton of respect for Gen Z. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah. Like, do, do you know um, Inter Interlochen uh, Center for the Arts? It's a, yep. It's a music school. Yeah. So um, it's a place uh, like I used to teach. And, um, this year I didn't teach. I was just up with, with the baby, like babysitting. But one of the traditions is at the end of the concerts, um, you're not supposed to clap. It's a really bizarre. Um, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it. The tradition goes back to they used to, you know, in the 1920s, they would live broadcast the concerts, and so they asked the audience not to clap because then the broadcaster would say things. But anyways, blah blah blah. Oh, they they okay. still keep the tradition like that, um, and it's always awkward because they don't post it anywhere. It's like one of those unspoken rules, and like people, like parents come and they clap, and it's it's even more weird because it's like, it's like a small amount and other people going, Shh. but anyways, this last year, Gen Z, like they just like would do like standing ovations and like, and, and like yes. the, the administration was like, no, like, like, Shh. and they were like, fuck you. They didn't actually say that. But they, 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 they just like, and I was like, you know what? Like, I thought it was stupid. Like what, why, why did I like ever like just, go for it and you know well for, for uh, a second i thought you were you were going to say when you started on the story that like the tradition of not clapping goes back to this one year that the show was that bad <laughs> they just kept it <laughs> but yeah uh, it's just like let's say yeah they just had like this completely like that's a stupid thing and we're not going to do it and it was yeah, like yeah. i was like yeah actually it is a stupid thing <laughs> like um it's like nobody likes it nobody wants to go through it like <laughs> yeah my um my favorite um meme about generations is you've got the, the the two people screaming at each other and they're 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 labeled um boomer and millennial and then there's 
Um, the two that are labeled Jen, what am I doing describing a meme? But anyways, <laughs> <laughs> the, see, this is the combination Gen X and millennial. Yeah, that, that's kind of like, why do people listen to this show, right? Like yeah. they could be watching the Holy Mount right now, right. but we, they're listening they be, to us describe it. They could be looking at the meme and instead they're hearing me describe it. So the millennial in me is appreciating the, the meme. But then the Gen Xer in me wants to describe the meme and explain the joke. But so you've got the two people screaming at each other um, and, and they're boomers and millennials. And then the, the two that are labeled Gen X and Gen Z are um, Karen from um, Will and Grace. Um, and they're these two kids uh, who are next to her holding up uh, buckets for um, um, candy uh, for Halloween. And she's pouring wine into them. Um, Gen X loves Gen Z. We're not having this fight. We're in full support of them. Like, yeah, go you. You go and change the world. We're just going to sit here. You guys just, ugh, why are you fighting? Just ignore us. So like, anyway, <laughs> yes, I think Gen Z is great. Gen yeah, Z is going to make a too. difference. Hey, Gen, Gen Z is already making a difference. They brought clapping and standing ovations back to interlocking. Yeah. Like mm. after a hundred years. Yeah. <laughs> It was like, hey, yeah, um, so technology's moved on and it yeah. makes everybody feel weird uh, to not clap. The performers yeah. don't like it. The outsiders don't like it, which makes this place feel even more like a cult. Uh, <laughs> By the way, yeah. I'm the crank that doesn't like standing ovations for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it seems like every show now gets a standing ovation. I'm like, no, sure. it wasn't that good. It was fine. It deserves a clap. It deserves a clap while I sit down and clap politely, not right. stand up. Woo, woo, you know. well, I mean, it deserves for like me to pay for a ticket to go in. Like anything beyond that, like I paid them, you, you know. Like, I, I <laughs> they, didn't should have to move. they should be clapping for me. <laughs> <laughs> like I have to walk to my seat and I have to walk out. Maybe I have to walk out to go to the bathroom on top of that. I'm not getting paid for that. I'm paying for that, you know, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a free man. I, I clap when I please. Don't, don't clap on me. Uh, <laughs> so, so, since, since we're on meme describing, um, yeah. my all-time favorite meme kick right now is, uh, is any don't tread on meme, uh, me meme that's making fun of the the mm. the original. Like there's like uh, the one where it's like the snakes in like all gagged up and like in the bondage, and it's like, oh please tread on me. <laughs> like, like, I love that one. Um, I love the one where it's wearing a mask and it's like, don't spread on me. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, there's uh, there, there's um, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, there, there's the one where it's just like, um, it's like, oh yeah, oppress me. Like, I, I don't know, they're, they're, all, they're all good. They're all good. It's, it's yeah. one of my favorites. Or yeah, yeah, don't, do, no, no steppy on snake uh, <laughs> is a good one. <laughs> you, you could like, so, so I, I had an idea for a movie once. It was instead of snakes on a plane, it would be cheaper and easier to shoot. It would be called plane on a snake. <laughs> and it's just really slow and it's, and I mean, I guess this kind of goes back to earlier in the discussion, because I don't know if you could get away with this now, but it's just a plane on a snake. So you'd have to get like a CGI snake or you'd have to <laughs> get like a special pass from PETA, but just like slow it down to an hour and 30 minutes. And uh, <laughs> and, uh, and the, the poster is, yeah, yeah, just the don't tread on me snake. Like you just reuse that because like that extra place. effort kind of like doesn't reflect the spirit of the project. It's the don't tread on me snake and then like a toy Fisher Price plane. Oh my God, I'm dating myself. Um, <laughs> does Fisher Price still exist? <laughs> they, yep, they, they do, do. which they I, do. I just okay. found, I found this out this last year with the, with the newborn. Uh, they, okay, they are okay. Yeah, yeah, There's, they still have like a, a booming industry. Okay, uh, so I, I didn't date myself with a reference. I only dated myself by saying that I'm dating myself. Hey, is this a good time to play insult the guest? <laughs> <laughs> so just for listeners at home, um, um, without getting into any details, uh, 
uh, before before we started, uh, I was telling Dorian or Dan and I were telling Dorian about the time that I insulted uh, one of our early guests. <laughs> Actually, that's what we need new 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 um um what do you call it new feature on every episode. I need and the guest insults me. So uh, Dorian, <laughs> can you please insult me? Um. I think I did by saying I'm having a a weird reevaluation of of Gen X. I, I think I insulted. I think I insulted uh, yeah. yeah. Um. No, but my insult of you. No, it's not actually an insult. I thought it was funny. I I, I, I thought it was funny that you brought up Ornette Coleman earlier um, mm. in, in the context of the the music for this for the for this movie mm -hmm. and also your musical interest, right? So for two decades, I've been using Ornette Coleman as an example of music that I can't stand, but then it, it and it expanded a little further. So when it, telling people that I'll dance to anything, it's I'll even dance to Ornette Coleman. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, I said this. So so Thanksgiving last week, I was at my cousin's um, and I don't remember how it came up. Oh, it had to do with dancing. I had a, a, a my birthday party was a few days earlier. There was a lot of dancing, and I said something about about dancing to to, to any music, including Ornette Coleman. And my cousin said, "Who's Ornette Coleman?" And I was like, "Oh, well, uh, oh, I don't know uh, jazz, and um, I don't know how to describe it." So I went. She went on Spotify, put it on you know the speakers, and we were listening to Ornette Coleman, and I was like, "Oh, wait, actually, I'm kind of enjoying this." And an hour later, I suddenly realized, have we been listening to Ornette Coleman this whole time? Because I've been really enjoying this. <laughs> well, it's a little bit like John Coltrane, right? Like, you, know, like yeah. you can listen to, uh, like, my favorite things and then listen to Ascension. And it's like, it's two different groups playing, basically. Uh -huh. Like, I don't think it's that. I mean, Dorian probably knows a lot more about Ornette Coleman than I do. But I feel like there were some earlier Ornette Coleman records that weren't as like heavy into the noise. Mm. Yeah, but, that's true. It might have been it, it might have been in a, an earlier Ornette Coleman that we were listening to. Um, yeah, it's it's um just you know regarding Ornette, like he uh I can't even tell like um what his eras are anymore. Um <laughs> just like they kind of all are part of this Ornette Coleman. Fibonacci sequence right. and you can't tell <laughs> if it's spiraling out or spiraling in like like this there's a spiral that that part is clear um but uh yeah I feel like, like how the insane clown posse is the dark carnival <laughs> yeah yeah it's I mean you know like fucking magnets <laughs> how do they work um don't get me started about no scientists those motherfuckers lying and keep getting me pissed uh, which, by the way, um, just since you, since you did just bring up uh, ICP, and I'm I uh, horrifically just started quoting um, <laughs> the song "Miracles." Have you have you all seen the new uh, the new Kid Rock video no. that just came out? No, no, I've heard oh. so much about it, but I haven't seen it. Oh, it's it's um uh it might replace the holy mountain on friend test video oh um, wow yeah uh, that is shorter yeah it is shorter, shorter test well I, I mean shorter attention span you know like we're, we're the youtube generation uh but um but uh it it got to the point where weird al had to say thank you all for the compliments but that's not me that's actually <laughs> kid rock <laughs> um yeah, it's it's pretty great. Uh, it's you know like it, it's not good. Like I don't want anybody to think I'm a a fan of this kid <laughs> rock like video. Having like be good. Yeah, uh, so, like, say like that Paul one more time. Like like you know that Paul Anka song "Having My Baby," where it's like the worst song ever, but it's also like kind of the best song ever. Yeah, like it's 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 created its own meme culture that I'm interested to see how long like how, how it's going to cultivate because um yeah yeah there, there, there's there's just some really good there, there's some good stuff that's coming out of it and uh man uh i i highly recommend it's um what's it called kid rock uh don't tell me how to live is, mm. is the name. <laughs> yeah and you know is, is it okay if i if i give any spoilers uh yeah we're we're spoiler we're spoiled, right. spoiled. Yeah, so there's yeah, definitely a, 
Yeah, so there there is a spoiler in case you want to see this this cinema uh, masterpiece. Um, <laughs> but he he, you know, I don't really want to tell you. I think you just rocket ship. That's all I'm gonna say. Uh, rocket ship. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's there's a rocket ship. Um, well, you know, I wasn't I wasn't gonna bother watching it. Now I am. Now knowing that there's a spoiler, um, and that you you were reluctant to spoil it. Now now. Yeah. Well, thank you. Or I can cover my ears. You could spoil it for everybody else. <laughs> oh, we could do it that way. Uh, no, there, there, there's some really great lyrics. Um, like, uh, oh, let's see here. Um, okay, pull, pull, pulling up the, the lyrics. Um, years ago, we all thought it was a joke, see? That every fucking kid got a motherfucking trophy. But yo, homie, here's the situation. A nation of pussies is our next generation. And these minions and their agendas, every opinion has a millennial offended. But this Amendment 1, it rings true. And if you don't dissent, bitch, then see you, see you number two. Ain't nothing new. Right church, wrong pew. Get a clue, a crew, your fake news and your views can all get the bottom of my motherfucking shoe i'm the last of a few still screaming fuck you uh <laughs> that's wow. even worse than anything i imagined yeah it's, well, it's, and it's crazy because when you were reading that it like i don't know if it was your delivery or it was just the the kind of cadence of the words but it sounded like the tay bridge disaster it had like the same weird like cheats like you, you ever read the tay bridge disaster uh n no but uh okay. it uh, it's it's generally considered to be the worst poem in the english language <laughs> um i think that did, did i ever read it to you ron i think i read um, this to you at some you point it but yeah it was like it's a very popular genre of poetry uh in the 19th century like if a bridge collapsed or a train hit another train or something somebody would write a memorial poem and then basically photocopy a bunch of them and then try to sell them in the days after. And wow. that's where the great Tay Bridge disaster poem comes from. Uh, that's where, like, if you ever heard the song, The Wreck of the Old 97, that was one of those. Um, here we go. I found it. Okay. <laughs> Wait, you're not going to read the whole thing, are you? No. Oh, okay, good. Let, 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 let me find, like, a good representative passage, though. All right, because now I found it, and now I remember it. I remember not being able to make it all the way through. It's yeah, so it's long. long. <laughs> Let's see. As soon as the catastrophe came to be known, the alarm from mouth to mouth was blown, and the cry rang out all over the town, good heavens, the Tay Bridge is blown down. And a passenger train from Edinburgh, which filled all the people's hearts with sorrow, and made them for to turn pale because none of the passengers were saved to tell the tale how the disaster happened on the last Sabbath day of 1879, which will be remembered for a very long time. <laughs> and he repeats that will be remembered for a very long time thing like six times by the end of the, at the end of it, I think is okay. Yeah, the, the end of it is worth reading. So let's see. I must now conclude my lay by telling the world fearlessly without the least dismay that your central girders would not have given way, at least many sensible men do say, had they been supported on each side with buttresses, at least many sensible men confesses, for the stronger we our houses do build, the less chance we have of being killed. Thank you. I'm giving you a standing ovation, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> this, uh, so, this is Mr. I'm just imagining myself like right, like Bullwinkle as Mr. Know It All right now. <laughs> that was an excellent reading of a terrible poem. <laughs> it's beautiful, really beautiful. Yeah. That's that's my that's my reel when I go to Hollywood. It's just gonna be me reading. And that's still better than the Kid Rock song. That it is. There's a new worst poem out there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a kid rock song. I, I still don't know if that's as bad as the little Dicky song. Um, I don't shit, know that song. 
I for, I'm forgetting what the exact name of it was. It has like 40 guest singers on it, and it's like about saving the environment. And it's, I mean, it, if you're into like bad things, <laughs> this is unfortunately yes. <laughs> this might be the worst music video, maybe even worst music video and song of the entire 2010s for my money. <laughs> uh, Earth, here we go. It's called Earth. And uh, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's really, it's got that like hideous, like really lazy CGI animation. Um, and like, it, it's so bad, like he released it for charity the money's going to like a good charitable foundation and I still I don't think it's worth it like if I was running that charity I would want to give the money back and make the song not exist all right may I read the some of the lyrics for it yeah yeah go for it okay I'll read the beginning what up world I'm I'm, I'm doing a very dramatic reading here what up world, it's your boy, just one of the guys down here. Well, I could be more specific, uh, I'm a human. Uh, the uh is actually in there. And I just wanted to, you know, for the sake of all us earthlings out there, just wanted to say, we love the earth, it is our planet. We love the earth, it is our home. We love the earth, it is our planet. We love the earth, it is our home. I'm not gonna read anymore. Um, yeah, yeah, it sounds like he's gonna get evicted or something. Like the guy's got money. Yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't heard it. It, it, it might it might sound better, like if it was it, actually it it sung the way. To, it sounds worse. Oh, my reading was better than the actual song. Yeah, I mean, I, I just I watch that. I, I think of like that that episode of the Tick where there's is like some like Galactus. It's going to eat the Earth, and then he's just like the Earth. That's where I keep all my stuff, and. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not as sentimental about this as little Dicky is. Wait, that's where that line's from? The Earth, that's where I keep all my stuff? Yeah. Yeah, that's from the, the Tick cartoon. Oh. Ah. Okay. I knew the joke. I didn't know that that was, the, that, that that was its origin. At, At least, least that's the place. earliest place I ever heard it. Okay. No. Yeah. So if you heard it before 1995... So then somehow we ended up talking about having kids and ended up talking about Dorian's relatively new baby. Like, it, 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 yeah, it's got to be hard, hard why, because I can't imagine myself ever doing that. I mean, and at the rate I'm going, I'm never going to have to do that. <laughs> it's also like, just to be like totally up front, it's like <laughs> trying to weigh the pros and cons and like, moral values like it's like oh my god like i swear all the fucking time like and like it hit me it was like well i don't care about swearing and i don't care if she knows about swear words but it was like oh fuck like she'll go to school and like <laughs> teach those words and then like there can be like well and she's know, like the cool kid at the school yeah like, yeah well, be in that age like the kid that knew all the swear words when you're like six Oh yeah. That's like that's the alchemist. That's the person taking you up the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and like what's the what's the you know the end of the, the meaning at the end of the mountain is is you make your own choices. Like, <laughs> I, but it's like it, it it is one of those things like um just actually starting to process things. Like I, I actually remember seeing, you know, like Nightmare on Elm Street when I was a little kid, like you know four years old and like it scared scared me forever you know and like like, like you watch it now and it's like very clearly 80s uh 80s effects um you know like not not the groundbreaking effects that terminator is and always will be um terminator 2 terminator 2 that's yeah, the movie. actually yeah. actually yes uh but but it's it is one of those things where it's like you know, I gotta be careful about like figuring out what I can have around her because she's starting mm -hmm. to pick up on this stuff, and like mm -hmm. that—that's a super interesting space. Like, I—I uh, I mean, like the Holy Mountain, I couldn't just like throw it in. Like it was like, oh, she'll get it. She'll she'll see this is like, you know, <laughs> just some wacky movie from from the seventies. Like, you know, mm -hmm. it's like it's like, oh right, that's 
that's like 40 years of therapy. Like, you know, um, yeah. Uh, and, and then I guess like, you know, last but not least, like, uh, like one, one other area that's just kind of been contemplating is like, like, you know, like what ideological space could she end up occupying? Mm -hmm. That would be the hardest for me to like cope with. Cause I know that I am a shock to my parents. Like my parents are very conservative, very Republican. Well, there's like a, I mean, there's like a non-zero chance that that she could end up being like a Nazi or something. Right. Well, well, like what what I found, I think the hardest to deal with would be if she went full fascist. Like mm. that's like almost easier to like. All right, there's something bigger going on. Like, well, but like I think a moderate Republican would actually be the first. <laughs> it's like it's like no, Dad, I don't disagree with your need, you know, your with your views, but the free market. We just the freer the market, the freer the people. Ta taxation is theft. Like I like in smaller government like i, I uh, like you that gave birth to mitt romney yeah like i think that would actually be the hardest to like cope with like <laughs> uh <laughs> and like i'm kind of joking but I, i'm kind of like completely <laughs> serious because uh -huh. it's like it's like i'm equipped to deal with a nazi like i don't know how to deal with like a you know a, a, a small government republican <laughs> like because <laughs> um, yeah, you know, well, like, like, first off, like, they're not actually small government people, like, you know, they, they love huge government, they're just, just not for, you know, helping people. Uh, like, um, but, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, so that, that has been an area where it's like, it's like, what could she grow into that would actually be the most challenging to, like, to like be in the same room yeah and i think uh, this is kind of underlining like why i don't have it because i i would like kick him out the second i figured out they didn't like lou reed or something right like like you're talking about shit that matters right and I'm like, <laughs> yeah i know that i'd be getting into shouting you know, i ironically appreciate alf you're not my child <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I know that I'd get into shouting matches over any disagreement. Um, so actually, full-on fascist or liberal Republican, uh, not liberal, well, moderate Republican um, um, would be just nonstop screaming. So that's why I, I can't have kids because I don't want to, I'm not going to be able to, to, to contain myself. Also, I think like 80% like of the things in my apartment are like a choking hazard. Because <laughs> there's like all those screws from all that shit I've taken apart. <laughs> there there are so many death traps that i didn't even know about like um like today you know she there's this chair and she's like climbing on it and it's like it's like super cute like you know but like but it's also like oh my god ha, terrifying seriously get down though um but like after like the fifth or sixth time like you kind of just like all right like she's got to learn and like she <laughs> you know she learned she fell off the chair and like fell into like a block of it, like we, we were stacking blocks up and mm -hmm. you know like like she she cried and it was tragic but it was also like it was like now you know like but, mm -hmm. but it's just yeah um yeah i mean like my apartment sometimes like if i haven't cleaned it in a while like you could believe that like sids could happen to an adult like sads i guess you would call it <laughs> right, <laughs> but, but no there's just like stuff everywhere like it, 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 it just looks like it, at least when i'm in in the mindset i've been in in the last 30 seconds like my like i used to think that that, that my house screamed like bachelor chic and now i'm re realizing it just screams like adult crib death <laughs> <laughs> all of it oh man all right, now I'm well, looking around my apartment to try and figure out what it, what what would be required to baby proof it. Yeah. Well, well your, your like, apartment's a lot less precarious than mine is, I think. Yeah. Mine would be easier to baby proof. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh it is funny. Um this will be my my last baby comment. Um but <laughs> I, I've got I've got a bookshelf uh that she like just comes over and takes all the books out and it's mm -hmm. like it's kind of at the point where you know it's like it's like she's it's better to just let her pull the books out once mm -hmm. 
instead of trying to like stop her from doing it because that will just be the next hour but it's pretty wild because like you know she it looks like she's like into some really really dense shit like (laughs) you know like she's got like you know, like uh, she was reading the Quran and the Communist Manifesto and the Anarchist <laughs> FAQ and the Anatomy of Fascism and uh, the the Art of War and um, <laughs> yeah, uh, the Warehouse, which is a dystopian novel basically about Amazon taking over the world. Uh, you know. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd look out if I were you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the new Jim Crow. Uh, what else was she reading today? Oh, the Doors of Perception, which is the Alice you know, the, Huxley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the Conquest of Bread. Uh, the War. <laughs> it's literally a book just called The War. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, she just like pulls all this out, and she's like, "I'm just gonna bathe in in all these horrifying subjects." My uh, and, uh, my dad had a huge uh, vinyl collection. And um, we knew how much I appreciated music um, as a very young kid from when I was about like, I don't know, two years old, probably the time that on a Sunday morning, my dad came downstairs and find that not only had I taken all the records out of the shelf, I'd also taken all the records outside of the sleeves and spread them all over the floor. Whoa. (laughs) My my mother used to have trouble getting me to school in the morning because I would just compulsively start like stacking piles of comic books <laughs> like I would think I was organizing them but they'd always end up on my floor <laughs> I still do that basically that's basically what I do for a living yeah <laughs> and sometimes they're they're actually connected by like you know which series they're 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 from right sometimes I, mean, I looked through them for the first time in like eight nine years it was pretty disorganized (laughs) no you know they told me that i needed to like grow and and learn things and develop as a person but i i didn't (laughs) you're still stacking comic books on your floor okay you you want to see what my bedroom looks like that's pretty much yeah Dorian, i've been to i've been to his place he's not exaggerating so (laughs) It's it's like the back room of a Salvation Army. And I got like a bunch of boxes of cassettes coming in the mail in a few days. More things to stack. More things to, well, I bought some wood cases too. So I, mm. I have those like wood racks. Yeah. Do mm. you stack the racks? I do. <laughs> See? like Because I had enough wall space. I had a full wall of cassettes. And then I narrowed it down a bit. And then I use per that wall for something else. And now I still have a wall of cassettes, but I don't have a wall to put them on. Patient engages in stacking behavior. <laughs> <laughs> this has some found footage vibes going on right now. <laughs> More cassettes, all cassettes. Wow. So um, you, you sell cassettes like... Uh, what uh That's most of my average? business at this point yeah mm, cool um, i sell other stuff but but cassettes are uh people haven't caught on that the prices went up mm. um like not on all of them but like they're like 2020 uh cassette sales doubled in the u.s mm. wow um and yeah some of the stuff because i was just collecting hip-hop tapes like i have a a lot of hip-hop tapes just because i have a tape deck and they were fun yeah some of those like my copy of the first wu-tang clan records worth like 130 bucks now like on a cassette which is like nuts but uh yeah so there's people i'm trying to move as much as i can into the cassettes just because they don't take up much space compared to all the other stuff Mm-hmm. and they're all the same size um and it's still, like, it's still like fun to go digging for them because like the record stuff mostly got picked through unless you're at like a record fair it seems like yeah hmm. wow the of cassettes is those things that invariably the the tape deck is going to m- munge <laughs> the tape it is going to come out get all crinkly and mixed up and you're not going to be able to recover and now you throw out the tape and mm. thank goodness for, for cds 
CDs are starting to come back too, which is like not uh, cassettes are more expensive than CDs now, but uh, cassette pr- or CD prices are starting to go up a bit. No kidding. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it makes sense, right? Because you have a verified copy of like, I know I am getting this pressing of this record mm-hmm. here. Whereas if I download it, um, usually downloading is pretty reliable, but I've definitely gotten copies of records where there was like stuff missing because they ripped it wrong or something. Mm-hmm. Um, I just not, not the strongest argument to go buying objects, but... I just use Spotify because I don't want the artists to get any meaningful royalties. <laughs> yeah, like you know, it's like you you listen to artists on you know, it's like you can get them a whole like twenty cents. Uh, <laughs> like if you, oh, man. yeah, I like CDs because I find like weird shit. Like, uh, so I bought those CDs from that dude in that parking lot earlier, uh, and there was a CD that was signed by this guy that I knew like fifteen years ago. Oh, that's um, cool. It was really weird. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um. Yeah, you know, you find like, especially with cassettes, like I found some really weird, I have probably the only copy of this recording of like a meeting with St. Kirpal Singh um, was in like a, a Goodwill. Yeah, because like cassettes, that, that was like the home recording medium, right? So you're going to find a lot of like amateur, like single release, vanity release kind of stuff you're not going to find on the more expensive formats. Mm. Yeah. You know, I want to say I don't understand why cassettes make a comeback and why people are collecting them, but that's really true for anything that that that, that people collect. You know, it's mm. um, why 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 do people care about um, dolls? Okay, fine, I'll call them action figures. And you know, why do you have to have them in the uh, um, uh, um, what is it in the case and unopened and all that? Don't you want to play with that thing? Mm. I'm like, why would you pay so much money for a toy? Yeah, okay. So I'll say, why would you pay so much money for a cassette tape? Because mm. I want that cassette tape. Right, with the cassette tape, at least sometimes it's the fact that what's on the cassette tape is like inaccessible anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of it is just, yeah, they're easy to store. They're not big. If you have a good cassette deck, they sound really good um if you don't have a good cassette deck they're gonna sound like garbage but um spotify sounds pretty good at my stereo system yeah yeah <laughs> so, anyway this is a tangent this, yeah yeah sorry sorry yeah. no 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 it's like uh this is the holy mountain you know like of cassettes like <laughs> thinking of holy mountain <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so I'll I'll probably have to jump off here, okay? Because uh, okay. yeah. Um, Any final but, thoughts? Well, I, I I was gonna say um, that uh, if you haven't seen the Holy Mountain, uh, don't do it. But if that <laughs> hasn't stopped you from checking it out, um, consider watching another movie. But <laughs> if these two warnings have not uh, have not um, dissuaded you from from doing this to yourself uh watch watch the holy mountain um i used to have a vhs copy of it and yes uh <laughs> yeah and so now how many bags of popcorn do you give to having children uh, <laughs> um you, you don't have to answer that. yeah i'll i'll I, i'll just I'll, I'll say you know a movie theater a movie movie theater. Theater. And, yeah and, and just you know there, there's a lot of operating costs that you don't know about uh like <laughs> like seems fun but uh <laughs> yeah um movie, yeah movie theaters make most of their money off their 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 uh, their concessions mm, so true. um so so i think that's a um that's a net positive yeah mm. and also like popcorn is probably it's pretty cheap to make and they charge like like 500 children for uh, a bucket. Uh, so, yeah, but cool. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, Dan, you want to do um, the outro? Oh, sorry. Yeah, all right. So this has been Dan. Oh, uh, and <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and and I don't say- want to tie, by the way. <laughs> I don't know why that suddenly felt so abrupt to me. 
And I'm wrong. Just right in front of your face. What do you see, sir? <laughs> <laughs> You're walking through a forest. Yeah. Um, no, and and I'm Ron. Yeah, uh, and yeah, I'm I'm Dorian. Thank you all so much for uh, having me on. Um, you know, it's like always a super blast to see where <laughs> it ends up getting. Uh, you know, um, uh, yeah. We get uh, weird. Yeah, it's super weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, it was great. It was great to have you on again. It was great to see and you. And if people yeah, yeah. want to find your uh, your stuff, where do the where should they go? Yeah. So, um, uh, you can check out my website www.dorianwallace.com because uh, that has links to everything. I actually started a new podcast uh, that has only had two episodes at this point. Uh, it's called Dorian's Mode, and it's just shooting the shit with people about various topics um the episode that's coming out um next week is uh it's it's an opera singer i'm friends with who has a really deep love of queen uh oh. and so we just talk about queen um you know but there, there's other there's other things like uh somebody down the line there's a composer friend who found out has a really serious passion for 3d printing like to the point where like it was like what do you need to know and he sent me a powerpoint from a presentation he's given on it before and you know it's it just stuff like that it was like wow i didn't know any of this about you <laughs> like and yeah. yeah so uh but yeah D dorian's mode if you want to check that out um, okay. yeah yeah yeah, Where, yeah well, we'll have to like uh all these different podcasts is gonna have to be like an avengers yeah Style, like everybody from every one of the podcasts gets together in a room and like talks over each other yeah like at the at the uh the end of one of my podcasts there's a ps where ron and dan just pop up and it's like by the way we need you for this other <laughs> podcast <laughs> we've got we've got an onet coleman emergency yeah <laughs> i know just the guy um <laughs> Hello. yeah there is uh you know just just to finalize uh if, if you ever want to dance to ornette coleman take a lot of acid um oh, and okay. i think it i think it can actually work uh yeah well, and I've specifically never listen listen to the shape of jazz to come uh for all you not kids listening um so. what is it again the shape of the shape of jazz to come okay isn't that his first album that's his first album it's yeah. uh all right. Step yeah. one, take acid. Step two, listen to the shape of, of jazz to come. All right. Got yeah. it. Yeah. I think yeah. acid is one of the few things I've never taken. Yeah. I'm saving that for a special occasion. Yeah. If you want to do something way horrifying for your first time, uh, listen to uh, Skies of America, which is an Ornette Coleman piece he did with full orchestra that gets really raunchy. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's just like, it's like, all right, man. C cool. Uh, you do you, man. Uh, it's it's great. It's great. Um, but yeah, cool. Yeah, we'll I have to like take acid live stream it. So it, like, like, there's that episode of the Tom Green, like the not not the MTV Tom Green, but like the internet stream Tom Green, where he's like, I think they drank an entire case of Coors Light and they just kept live streaming it. So there's points where him and the guest are both passed out for like 30 minutes at a time wow yeah yeah and like, right. but he didn't take the the acid thing yet so that could be our hook hmm. so so should i go to upstate new york and and we'll do it together or should we do it i'm in boston you're in new york i don't know we could call it like fear and loathing on the anomaly questionable movies podcast <laughs> but anyway so this this has been dan and this has been Ron. And uh, our guest today was Dorian Wallace. Go check him out at his website. Go check out the Tristero Collective and go check out Dorian's Mode, the new podcast. Cool. Thank you all for having me on. And uh, take care, everyone.